Good morning and welcome to our second day of the Donner Doom Conference. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Our speaker uh, first off here is Karthik Kanan. Karthik Kanan is a professor of manage management in Purdue's Cranert School of Management. He has proposed design for instincts as a way for businesses to effectively organize in the current age. The concept focuses on designing nudges to exploit instincts and biases to generate desired human behaviors. And his research uh, and teaching also relate to the same themes. He has published research papers in leading conferences and journals, including management science and information systems research. Uh, Kanan obtained his PhD in information systems, his master's degree in electrical and computer engineering, and his master's in philosophy in public policy and management, all from Carnegie Mellon University. Today he will present a talk titled Nature of Future Jobs, Innovation Designed for Human Instincts. Now please silence your electronic devices, but don't put them away. We encourage you to tweet the hashtag Dawn or Doom and post to Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever social site you prefer. So please welcome uh, Dr. Karthi Kanan. Thank you very much, thank you. Good morning. Am I too loud? Yeah, that's okay, okay. Yes, good morning, bright and uh, early. Um, let me just take a minute or two to introduce myself. I call myself as a non-engineering engineer. Right? Uh, I'm from the School of Management. I'm still an engineer at heart. I did my undergrad and master's graduate studies also in engineering. So, slow. slow. The way I look at problems is how do we design stuff? When I say designing stuff, I'm talking about how, we, how do we design engagements. It could be socioeconomic engagements, it could be marketing campaigns, it could be HR policies. In the broad spectrum of things, that's exactly what I'm doing. I look at this problem from various different angles, and today what I'm going to do is talk about what I teach in my class called Designing for Human Instincts. That's part of the class that I teach. Now, this has very many implications as we go through this automation and the nature of jobs that are changing. And, and I'm going to tie this all back together and to tell you what I anticipate the future is. So you might all be wondering, what is design for instincts? Right? I mean, this is like a catchphrase, but uh, people want to know, but don't know what it is. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to play a game. You, as audience, are going to help me with this game. And I want about 20 volunteers. I'll ask you to come in a minute. But what, for the rest of the folks who are sitting out there, please play, pay close attention to these volunteers who are going to be coming up. And how they are behaving and all of that. Observe them. Okay. Um, let's start with this game. I'm going to call this as a birthday game. Okay. So I'm going to take 20 volunteers up. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in a straight line up front. And the key thing is, once you start coming up here, you cannot talk or you cannot write to communicate. OK? And here's the challenge for you. You're going to order yourself according to your birth day. Right? Date and your month. I don't want to know about your year. Right? So I would like for you to come up front. You're going to sort yourself based on your date and month, not on your year. And January 1st in one corner, December 31st in the other corner. Okay? So I want about 20 volunteers. Just come on up. Come on up, say. You cannot talk or write to communicate with anybody. I want some more volunteers, please. You need about 20, otherwise it's not as engaging.
All right, you can go back to your seats. I just wish to say anybody that's taping this knows all our birthdays now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Did you guys observe some behaviors? All right, I'm going to take this uh, question back to the audience. Uh, they need, uh, well, this is not how I wanted the microphone to come off. Um, how was the engagement? Said. So tell me a little bit about what you thought was going on there. So for me, it was quite easy because I, I'm in, I was one in the first month. So mm -hmm. I knew where to go imme almost immediately. But the problem was with, the, with those in the middle months. So okay. They were having a bit of a problem. Right. And did you notice people were smiling? Why were they smiling? Why do you think they were smiling? Yes. They were trying to be polite, but also the gentleman over there, he had a glee on his face all throughout. I don't know if you guys paid attention. He, some of them were serious, right? The, the gentleman out there who was talking about towards the end of the birthday, he was also very happy. He, had his, uh, he was having a smile on, right? And when I said, go back and sit down, how did you guys, the people who were in the, did they relax? How were the people in the art in that uh, volunteers who were there? Hesitated for a second. So hesitated for a second. <laughs> Why did that hesitation happen? What are Game's the over. You know, you made me come there and stand there, and I didn't give you the closure. Right? Right? You were expecting me to do this, and I intentionally did not. This is an example of how you could design with human instincts into consideration. You can create challenges that are engaging. If you look at this, the challenge I gave was you can't write or talk. And you could overcome this challenge by showing your fingers and all of that. That was fun. Right? It was not too much of a challenge. And you're OK with doing this. And that created some excitement. That created some engagement. And then when I asked people to leave, they were, uh, I I've seen much more resistance than what I saw here, right? And I would say, some people would say, are you sure you're saying this, right? They, they took all this effort in a class of about 40 or 50 students. When you do this, you really will have resistance much more explicitly, right? This is fundamentally what we're talking about as designing for human instincts into consideration, okay? So in case you missed the rest of the talk and you got, this is, bottom line up front of what my uh, talk is about, the future of the jobs is going to require us to understand human instincts and be creative about stuff. And so as we go through the future generations, we are going to increasingly see focus towards social intelligence, emotional intelligence, and understanding of these elements. So now I'm going to begin the lo longer talk, um, and we'll finish the rest of the uh, duration with this. The reason for my interest in this topic is another instinctual behavior, self-preservation. Right? Self-preservation manifests in these two regards. It's about fight or flight. I need to figure out where I can find food to eat, or if there is a fight, I'm just going to leave if I'm not going to win. Right? And the other one is, how do I make sure my future generations are successful? This is a very normal uh, human behavior, or for, for that matter, any living organism exhibits this behavior, right? The case in point um, is my two children. The question I was facing with was, what kind of world are they going to face, and how do I prepare them for it? Just to put it in context, my first son was born in 2004, right? Um, the second one was born in... Uh, 2011. I knew from the beginning that the nature of jobs has been changing for a while. This is a picture from an economist. What's been showing us is the manufacturing jobs are coming down, the agricultural jobs are coming down, 
right? We need to be thinking about services and engagement. And in 2004, or close to it, I thought, you know, one-sixth of the world population has to know Chinese, Mandarin. So I'm going to teach my child Mandarin. This was my only child at the time, right? And fortunately for me, I was such a good procrastinator that Google came up with this Google Translate. Okay? And so, and then when my second child was born, I didn't even have to think about uh, you know, teaching him Mandarin or Chinese. And I said, you know, this is surprising. Between my generation and my child's generation, I can see difference. In my high school, I remember going through it and doing square roots of numbers by hand. You know, if it's 26, how do you do the square root? We didn't use calculators to do them. We would do them on a board or a piece of paper. But when I ask my child the same question, the answer is C. Right? I knew that there was going to be difference. But what was surprising to me was how different it was between my two children. 2004 and a 2011 bald child. I teach a class on digital transformations in my MBA program. Such Dilbert comic strips are books of prophecies for me. Right? So when you think about how much and how drastic these changes are, you have to sit and ponder what that future will be and what, whether your own job has to be thought about differently, right? So, sorry. Um, obviously, right, so given I'm an academician, you go and look for literature related to this, looking at um, where they have talked about the technology and change. This is one of the core themes I do as research and um, I, I'm interested in this topic independent of that too. So you probably, some of you heard about uh, the talk that Marcus Shingles gave yesterday. And there is quite a bit of overlap in the next few slides. Right? There is quite a bit of, uh, if you think about this, technology change is transforming many different aspects of businesses. Okay? Let's start with this first one. In 2004, this was a book from MIT by a couple of economists. And if you look at the bottom of this book, the book is titled as The New Division of Labor. How Computers Are Creating the Next Job Market. They go on to say, you know, the bakery truck driver, they're talking about how the driving of a truck happens. The bakery truck driver is processing a constant stream of information from his environment. To program this behavior, we could begin with a video camera and other sensors to capture the sensory input. But executing a left turn across an oncoming traffic involves so many factors that it is hard to imagine discovering the set of rules that can replicate the driver's behavior. This was in 2004. DARPA put out a challenge in 2005. And this challenge, the initial cars, this is how these initial cars were. Okay, this is what in 2005. Fast forward to 2016, and you have autonomous cars everywhere. You guys have seen this many times over. This is not as, many, as much surprising as it is. What do you see here? What is this? What do you see here? Accelerating pace of change. Specifically? It's a Forbes article, but specifically it's computer generated news. And if you paid attention to the author, his or her name is Narrative Science. This is coming from the College of Journalism at Northwestern University. I don't need to hire great investment analysts. I can let my software do the job. Okay. 
And you guys have seen this many times before as well, Jeopardy, right? IBM Watson participating in it. And Ken Jennings is one of the top notch um, Jeopardy players. And he is getting creamed by uh, IBM Watson, right? So what is that that we are, uh, what is that that we are dealing with here? IBM Watson has now extended and uh, IBM Watson, uh, as Marcus was also talking about, IBM Watson has learned law, has learned medicine, and many other domains as well. These are some uh, news articles related to IBM Watson. Right? IBM Watson is the, uh, may, be, may soon be the best doctor. Um, this is uh, why IBM bought just millions or, b or billions of medical images for Watson to look at. Where are we going with these? Right? It, I, I wonder why. But interestingly, right, at the end of the day, we are worried about two elements. To a certain extent, jobs and we, where we as a society are moving. And this is data from Economic Policy Institute. And this is showing you how productivity has been across the years, and you can see this, and how the wages have grown. It's interesting to see that early on, the wage and productivity were sort of matched. And after a while, there is some significant disparity. Right? So we are producing better outcomes, but we are not necessarily paying for this. What's driving this? One of the reasons is actually this automation we just talked about. Right? So uh, we've revisited this issue many times over in the past, Moore's law and the exponential rate of innovation. Right? This is showing you, if, in case people missed it, on your x-axis is this plot which shows you the, num the years. And on the y-axis, it's the logarithmic scale of the number of transistors on the chips. It's been um, argued that it's happened for about every 18 months or so, the number of processes have doubled. Uh, there is all this question about whether it's coming to this point where uh, the physics of it, are, uh, physics of these semiconductors are limiting whether Moore's law can continue in the future. That's not what I'm gonna be focusing on so much. Right? There is significant change and our ability to process linearity as opposed to exponential change is very, very high. Uh, how many of you were in Marcus Schinkel's presentation? Right? Uh, so many of you are, so you, you must have seen exactly this uh, slide he presented, the same notion that he presented. Right? If I take linear steps 31 times, where will I be? Maybe down the road. Right? But if I were to take exponential steps um, 31 times, right? we'll be 25 times around the world. Even though I told you about this in one context, it's very hard to imagine in a different context as well. There is the story about um, how a king was so happy that somebody came up with this innovation called the chess game. And so the king said, I will give you, the king agreed to reward the, this uh, discoverer one grain of rice in the first one, double the grain of rice in the second square of your chessboard, and quadruple it, twice that, in the third square, etc. Do you know how much that grains of rice at the end of the 64th square is? It's greater than the size of Himalayas. All together, add it up. Right? So it's very hard in a linear environment, first we understand stuff. In an exponential environment, we don't. Right? And many researchers have argued, I'm going back, a couple of, going back to a slide, many researchers have argued that this productivity wage difference is attributed to the technology changes. So if we are going to see more automation, if we are going to see more robots and computers coming in, the next question is, what is the nature of jobs in the future? This concerns me, partly because I'm in this industry which is going to be significantly affecting this. It's not just that I'm worried about my kids, it's I'm worried about myself now. We produce MBA students. We need to be thinking about 
how our students are competitive in the financial markets. Some of my uh, family members are physicians. If they're not radiologists, fortunately, no, not going to um, So what, is, what do radiologists do? They look at pictures, they look for patterns in the pictures, and they are discerning whether there is a problem or not. IBM Watson can also process the pictures. There is image processing that's done very, very well, right? And so you're going to see whether these kind of jobs that are getting replaced are not necessarily the more educated ones, are not necessarily the less educated ones, right? Radiology requires five years of education. You got to do be an internal medicine, and then you probably go on to radiology as a specialization. That job is not necessarily immune to automation now. Right? The next question is, are there differences? And there are. This is a picture from Wall Street Journal, which shows you how there are even routine cognitive tasks and non-routine cognitive tasks. Right? As you can see what the, tre what the trend line is looking like, and let me pay attention, ask you to pay attention to this part. This is the routine cognitive task, and you're, de you're seeing some decreasing interest in the routine cognitive tasks. So it's not, it's not necessary that education is going to be your uh, moat against this automation. Education is not. It's something else. What is that something else? In 2013, Arthur and Price, two MIT economists, looked at the nature of jobs, and they classified and they were plotting how the nature of jobs have changed. What do they point? Two main things, non-routine analytical jobs and non-routine interpersonal jobs, right? Ones where, which require understanding of other people's behaviors and then engaging with them differently. The market has been very successful or very good in rewarding innovations that are designed for human instincts. I'm going to give you the next few slides to show you how the markets have been rewarding them. Depending on the time, I'm going to slow or fasten some of the slides here. If there are any additional questions, I can always take them towards the end. So this is a comic strip. This is a comic strip uh, just to illustrate that same point. In 2009, the WhatsApp founder tried to get, it, get a job with Facebook. He was rejected. They go and find WhatsApp. WhatsApp satisfies a real human need, which is our in incentive, our interest in social interactions. Right? And so what happened? It became very popular, and Facebook threw in about $10 billion to buy them. Right? So if you understand human instincts, and if you develop, supply, def, develop uh, engagements around it, you tend to be more successful. Okay? So the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on giving you examples of how companies have designed either products processes or policies that appeal to human instincts. And you will see in many of these cases, these are very successful companies or at least very successful projects. Let's start with the first one, clothing. Everybody shops, right? So I'm going to ask this question differently between the men folk and the women folk in this audience. Okay. This is a question directed towards the men first. How many of you in this audience have the same version of the trouser, the same copy of your trouser, at least two, two times? Look around. Just look around, right? Now I'm going to ask you the same question to the women. How many of you have the same dress? or a suit, or anything else, which is at least two copies. 
same same dress look at this why and have you observed you know if if you're thinking about men right if you have the same version but if it's a different color it's very racy right so this is this is what we are talking about. There are instinctual differences between how women and men shop. Have you observed how men shop? What's the process? Anybody? As fast as possible. We go hunting. Right? And uh, how do women shop? Slow as possible. What's, what's driving their behavior? Their sense of being unique. Right? Men don't care about this. Let's slow the, instead of just saying as fast as a shop, let's pay attention a little bit more closely, right? If you have your husbands or your spouses or your uncles or your father, how do they go? Where do they go? They go in there, and what do they first do? Check measurements? Check price, okay? Check price first, and then, if at all we wanted, if your spouses ask you, you might go and do the fitting. Otherwise, you just pack it up and you come home. Okay? How do women shop? When does the price discovery happen? At the end. First is the fitness, not even the quality, right? Uh, it's the fitting. Okay? There are differences. Now think about this. And, and my wife is a victim to this behavior as well. If you have limited quantities of a particular product, women product, how do women behave? And if they like the product, they're not gonna wait. They're gonna grab that product and go in and buy the product. That's how we are tuned in our minds, right? So what does this do? A company, and so many of you know this company, Zara, takes advantage of this women's purchasing behavior and has designed its entire supply chain, taking into account this notion. In the business school, we teach students saying, you know, stockouts are bad. If you didn't sell a product, you are not doing it right. In this case, because of the women's instincts, you're not necessarily, stockouts are not necessarily bad for you. What this means is, if you look at this in an abstract sense, our traditional models of farm have looked at the boundaries of the farm and said, look, at the point when it goes to the retailer, I'm going to, that's all I'm going to look at. That's how the traditional supply chain models have looked at. Now, if you expand and include the consumers, and include these nudging behaviors as well, you're generating, you're obtaining higher degrees of freedom to optimize. Zara is one of the very successful companies in terms of its profitability, in, ter in terms of its margin. And what do they do? They intentionally send out, intentionally send out limited number of products every year, every week, every two weeks rather, and they do it pretty fast. They are, they are well known for the fast fashion, but their fast fashion does not happen without the instinctual behavior of women. The next product we're gonna talk about is that of Apple. In 2006, Apple came about with this technology, iPhone, iPod, and things of that sort, and one of the drastic changes that happened at the time was how this product was appealing to human instincts. I'm sure you've seen this, right? So you give, it, give this iPhone or your iPad device to your children, two-year-old, and they know, boom, how to use it. Now we're at a stage where, I, I mentioned this many times over as well, now we're at a stage where if your kid doesn't know how to use iPhone or iPad, to open it and all of that, you start worrying about the developmental issues. Right? And it's so instinctually designed 
that uh, it's changed the market. Now everybody else, you know, Samsung and all the Android devices are all doing similar designs, but Apple was the first one to change this and create this entirely new market. Again, another example. Now, I'm going to next focus on how do we design policies. Remember I said we're going to design process, products, and policies. So we talked about products. Let me give you a few examples about policies as well. How many of you have heard about this Valve software? Right? If you're in the gaming sector, you heard about this company. They have annual competition. They, uh, one of the famous games they had early on was called Half-Life. And now they are, Dota is the name of the game that they, uh, Dota 2. It's a big game. Annually, it's, the competition gets played. And the prize money, if you win a Dota championship, can be as big as $10 million. Okay. So I've had the opportunity of talking to some of the employees within Valve. And if you search for Valve Employee Handbook on the web, you're going to get that sort of a PDF file. If I can get my, yeah, this PDF file shows up. And you open it up, and there is going to be something that looks like this. Okay. It's our shorthand way of saying we don't have any management and nobody reports to anyone. We do have a founder slash president, but even he isn't your manager. This company is yours to steer toward opportunities and away from risks. You have the power to green light projects and the power to ship products. Very, very interesting, right? I often ask this question, how many of you are interested in going and working in this sort of a company? Or pretty much all the hands raise up. Fine. It's the independence we like. Independence is again a very instinctual element. Autonomy is what we call it as. Right? And so many companies are moved into the space and giving autonomy to their employees. You've heard about the 20% Google time. Similarly, there are, uh, you know, you've heard about this post-it. How was it discovered? During the doodle time by someone working in 3M, right? A lot of innovations do happen, and people cherish that autonomy, and sometimes even at the cost of a lower reward. This is another example where we're going to be talking about processes. As many of you know, Microsoft is a big behemoth. And they have Microsoft Office Suite, which is offered in tons of different languages. Turkish, Ch Mandarin Chinese, uh, Hindi, um, you name it, Nepali. And now imagine that they have to figure out translation errors. It's a very, very boring task. You know, even with the number of eyeballs you put in the fire, it's very, very hard and it's very boring, monotonous task. How do they overcome this issue? They created a game, right? Often my MBA students in my class say, you know, this lecture is boring, can you make it as a game? Right? Because they engage with games better. And so what happens? So they created a game. And it's called a language quality game. And even now, if you go to MSDN, you'll be able to see some of these. And uh, the game is as, as shown here. You have to either identify the error or say at least that there are no errors. And they collect all that information to identify bugs. This was a very successful venture. There was a Japanese team, it said, that they were trying to form a team and trying to discover bugs, and they wanted to win this, win this competition. They would take days off. They would go on leave, but they would come back to work so that they could play this game. Right? It was very successful in terms of Microsoft identifying these bugs. Right? At the, if you look at this from a process testing process standpoint, it just completely changes the behavior.
Similarly, Buffalo Wild Wings ran a marketing campaign and thought about processes very carefully and designed some engagements as well. Very successful in terms of how much of um, Facebook and Twitter feeds that they got. Um, they were very successful in terms of how they designed it. We, we discuss about this uh, particular example in our class in a lot more detail about how it appeals to human instincts and all of them. The end of the day, this is who we are. And when I say this, I'm being really serious. If you guys have a chance, please take a look at a TED talk by Laurie Santos. She's created a monkey economy in Yale. So these monkeys can really transact coins and get goods. And these monkeys exhibit many of the behaviors that we exhibit as well. And she talks about that. A couple of them in particular. Risk aversion, loss aversion. You guys have heard about these terms, I'm sure. right? These exact phenomena are seen there too. Right? And so it makes us wonder, yes, we are, we are having a better prefrontal cortex than most other organisms. And there have been evidence after evidence which shows that when we do the decision making and when we do behaviors, it's just not that prefrontal cortex is doing the job independent of it. There are amygdala and, and you know, the root of your brain, the brain stem as they call it as, right? And the um, elements that are there are interacting with the prefrontal cortex when you're making these decisions. I'm no neuro uh, scientist, so I, don't, I can't speak very much on this, but uh, take a look at those. I'm going to finish up with one last example. What do you just see here? Bug where? In a urinal. Why? Men's instinct is to hunt. And this behavior, as they claim it, reduces 80% spillage. <laughs> and this bug is placed everywhere. If you go to Chappal Airport, um, JFK airports, and other places, they have these bugs. Now there is a company which sells these bugs. <laughs> All right? This is another example of how do we design for human instincts. With this, I'm going to finish my talk. And if there are questions, I will take up further and I have additional material as well as we go on. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, one quick question. How do you determine uh, the difference between instinct and learned behavior? Because sometimes I think that can be tricky. Where Absolutely, right? So um, when we think about, for example, probabilities, we are awful in computing probabilities as humans in general, right? And um, so when people go through this learning process, they are able to overcome this. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have to spend time and effort in terms of changing their behavior through learning, and that works. In many other cases, if you just leave it for the instinctual aspects, uh, it's going to be this way. Um, what you could potentially do is incorporate learning in itself when you design some of the systems, right? Uh, so one of the examples that's often used, if you think about playing uh, Angry Birds, right? What do you do? You send the bird at an angle, and then once you have built that behavior or learned that process, you're upgraded. More complicated uh, projectiles start coming in. So you could incorporate learning within this. And one of the things we as uh, institutions need to worry about, how do we engage students using these sort of other phenomena and, and improve their engagement and their learning as well? Right. Any other questions?
either I must have impressed you so much or uh, everything was <laughs> completely oblivious. <laughs> Hello. So um, I've always wondered what is going to happen when we see a significant number of the jobs that are currently being done by humans uh, automated. I've heard people describe the idea that we won't have enough work to do as the lump of labor fallacy and that new, new jobs will be created. It seems like what's currently happening with automation is, is a, little more a little different than the Industrial Revolution and the Agricultural Revolution. How do you see that playing out? Do you think, we will, do you think the lump, lump of labor fallacy is a fallacy, or do you think that this time it's different? Um, to me, the, the nature of economy is going to change. And this is uh, my two cents on this. It's, we are trying to predict the future, right? Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in our uh, predictions. Two elements to this. One is um, the, the difference between what we would think of as a routine and a non-routine job that delineation is changing. Whatever was ro non-routine earlier is sort of becoming routine. And that's the, the sophistication in the autonomy we are building in. But that doesn't still, I, I do subscribe to, I, not everything that Mark Shingles talked about yesterday I do subscribe, but there are some elements I do subscribe to. It. One is, this is going to be, a, a, there is probably going to be a generation where we are in this creative world. We are offering individual creative services which could be put together to generate value, right? So I'm, I might be really good at understanding social intelligence, and you might be really good at understanding or creating mathematical formulations, taking into account what's going on. And it's about combining these services and creating value. That might be the way we might be going. That's personally my thinking. I don't have any evidence to uh, support one way or the other. Okay. Yes, please. I'd like to follow up on that. Please. So um, a lot of people talk about a creative economy. And so if you look at like almost any study, uh, the amount of people who, are who do anything that's relate remotely related to creative things is only 10 to 15% you know, of people like, you know, doing things that are quite different from other people, even like you know, in a routine job. So does that mean that maybe 10 to 15% of people are great and 9% of people are in big trouble? So, so you know, it's a function of what is also happening, right? So I don't see it too much of a need to change my behavior, then I won't change the behavior. But if you sort of force me to change the behavior, I will, right? Let me give you another example to explain this point as well. Target uh, developed a very good set of analytical tools in terms of prediction. And they were able to predict, and this is a very well-known story, you might have heard this many times over, they were able to predict based on uh, the oil people purchase, they were able to predict if somebody's pregnant or not. You've heard about this, right? So now what did Target do? It can't just take that idea and start sending coupon to everyone who was buying these oil, even if they know very well that the person is pregnant. What happens? Creepiness starts coming in. How does Target know this? So do you know how Target responds these days? They send out a coupon where they will put a baby diaper in, and right next to the diaper, they will put coupons for red wine glasses. And they are reducing that creepiness. So yes, in the analytical sense, you're thinking about innovations there. But it's not just that. It's about understanding what the human behavior is and then overcoming that too. Okay? Similarly, you know, when you think about, if you look at the AI tools, and we've had this discussion uh, yesterday with Marcus and Jennifer Neville as well. And one of the themes that is oftentimes mentioned is these AIs are not that sophisticated yet in terms of understanding human emotions. And uh, Jennifer Neville is working on this computational humor, which is an entire domain in itself. Humor is just one sort of a behavior. Right? If you think about the spectrum of emotions we exhibit, humor is just one. But there is, even that is very hard. Right? So there might be a little bit more opportunity in terms of uh, how we understand humans better than uh, a software or an um, AI can do. Personally, my thought. And I don't think it's going to be just the 90% who's going to be with our job. I think the necessity is the mother of all inventions as well, right? So people will change behavior, I think. That's very optimistic. Thank you. Thanks. I live in the uh, Detroit area, and we're seeing a very big decrease in the number of students 
that are wanting to go into the skilled trades. And this is becoming a big problem. And I don't think in this country we do a very good job of encouraging students that they can have a career and make a good you know, salary by working in the skilled trades. Uh, robots are not gonna be able to build buildings and run conduit and pull wires and do welding and all these things that they need to build a new building. I don't think we're doing a very good job at uh, telling students that they can have a career even not by going to college, but by going into the skilled, the skilled trades. So uh, two responses to this. Um, skilled labor doesn't necessarily mean it's a routine job. Okay, uh, Think about plumbing. And if there is water in your, um, uh, I remember this when our dean showed a, a picture where the water is up to the urinal, basically in a bathroom. Right? How do you fix this problem? A robot is not going to be able to know where the problem is necessarily, right? So necessarily, not, I'm not completely bought into that either, right? So, but it's those are the jobs where you'd say that if there are non-routine problems, there is value add. If you are thinking about construction specifically, I'm not sure if there is going to be a, just the construction part, right? There is going to be necessarily automation cannot come in. We have 3D printed houses that have come in China that are pretty solid from what we've seen. The, again, these are all uh, news articles and others, but potentially there are. So you've got to focus on whether it's a routine or a non-routine jobs, and how much of a market exists for these non-routine jobs. That's what we should be focusing on. If not, thank you. Appreciate your uh, presence. And